Good afternoon. I'm Stephen Gourier, and I am presently sitting in Galveston, Texas. Uh, very fortunate to be here today. Uh, it's a fortuitous journey that I'm back here on today as we approach the end of 2023. Uh, I am uh, essentially finishing up a 32-year career in public education. Uh, how I got to 32 years in public education, I can't tell you. But what I can tell you is where it began was here in Galveston, Texas. So uh, the journey in Galveston, Texas began in 1968. My mom and dad moved down here from Indiana. Uh, my mom had been a military nurse and my dad had been a graduate student at the Ohio State University. And they had met in New Orleans at Xavier and Dillard. And you know that New Orleans love blossomed. And as a result of that, there were four sons that were born from that union. We moved to Galveston County. Uh, my dad opened up the lab over here at the Public Health Service Hospital here on 45th Street. And he was employed there till probably about 1981. My mom and dad got divorced around 1973. So uh, my mom and my brothers and I, we ended up moving to Columbus, Georgia. Uh, we got uh, raised by my grandparents out there. And then we came back to Texas about the time that I reached uh, junior high school. So once I got back here, uh, I enrolled in Lamarck ISD, uh, attended Lamarck Junior High School, Lamarck High School. Uh, fortuitously, my senior year, uh, I was supposed to graduate from Lamarck High School, but uh, I'm just calling it fate. I ended up in Galveston ISD because I missed a significant amount of school as a junior at Lamarck High. So I came to Galveston Ball, and the, the, there was just a night and day difference between Galveston and Lamarck. Um, Galveston definitely was a more open uh, setting. I, I remember we had a uh, student smoking area, and there could have easily been a couple of hundred kids out there smoking uh, at any time during the day. Uh, you could leave campus for an hour, go anywhere you want to go in the on the great island of Galveston. And we took advantage of that. Uh, I had a couple of friends here uh, that we basically, you know, we hung out. And I would go from Parkland to Palm Terrace to Cedar Terrace to Oleander to Magnolia. And we were just out doing what kids would do at a lunch hour. So we fortunately were able to make it back to campus. Uh, sometimes we would, be just beyond the reach of uh, Radon Dillon, who was security for uh, Ball High School, and we knew how far his cart would go, and we were just beyond the reach of Mr. Radon Dillon, and he would always be telling us, yeah, you better not let me catch you. But I appreciate Mr. Dillon later in life because he helped, um, you know, keep me on track, and I eventually became a fraternity brother of Radon Dillon, who was a Detroit Lion back in the 1950s. I never knew that about Radon until later in life. But Stephen, if you could go back in time and come face to face with the 16 year old Stephen Gourier, what would you share with him? What would you tell him? Yeah. First of all, I would tell him that uh, he's a leader and he needs to quit being a follower. Uh, I had been a leader since I was eight years old. So there was no need uh, once I got into my teenage years to now revert to uh, being easily led astray. So I would tell that 16 year old Steven to uh, get his head out his, you know what, and get on the right track. Cause you know, my mama don't play that. And I know she didn't play that. As a matter of fact, she'll show up belts blazing if there was ever anything going on that she felt like needed to be corrected and she didn't really care where it was. So, you know, those are some of the other fun experiences I had growing up. And uh, yeah, those are fun memories. Who was the biggest role model in your life and why? Mm -hmm. I would for sure say my mom uh, in as much as she set that, that mindset. I call it a millionaire mindset. You know, sometimes you have to live the reality before things actually come into fruition. So, you know, my mom went to work from 
seven o'clock in the morning and she uh, worked two jobs. So she had a seven to 3.30 job at the school nurse and then she went to a, one of the hospitals in the area and she worked that three to 11 shift. And she did that for several years, you know, while taking care of me and my brother. So, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of family time as far as, you know, nighttime stories, bedtime stories, things like this. Uh, but what mom did, she created that expectation that you got to go to work, man. For whatever it is you want in life, you got to be willing to put in that work. Uh, hard work is undefeated. Uh, if you're willing to persevere and push through and do whatever you got to do to, you know, get that assignment done, hey, you do what you got to do. What's the biggest obstacle that you've had to overcome? The biggest obstacle I've had to overcome really would be that self-doubt. Uh, that little six-year-old boy that was probably scared because mom and dad had broken up. And uh, now, you know, I have to be the big brother. You know, I'm the oldest of the four, so I have to be big brother, have to set the example. I have to keep all of them in check while trying to keep me in check. And ain't none of that easy. Ain't none of that easy. A recurring theme in our conversation, Stephen, mm -hmm. has been Galvish. Yeah. You bounced out, you come back. Yes, you sir. You bounced out, you come back. What's yes, special sir. about Galveston? Oh, my God. Galveston is such a phenomenal historical place. And I would really challenge everyone. If you don't know the story of Galveston, Texas, you are really missing out on the history of America, really the history of black folks in America. Because everything that was great started here in Galveston and evolved from Galveston. It, it, it launched from the port of Galveston whenever they were bringing the ships here. I mean, and then they brought cotton here and they put cotton on the rail line and there's so much history that's still here. As I walk around downtown Galveston here, I read all of the historical uh, markers and I see all of this history around us. And I'm trying to transpose myself to back to the 1960s when I was here walking around in downtown Galveston. And I remember some of it because, you know, when you're a kid, you remember, but you don't remember. I remember going out to Galvez Mall, which no longer exists, but that was an actual place where they had a theater here, uh, you know, right before you got on the causeway down there. Uh, we had the, the Moody, uh, it was just a huge convention hall uh, right next door to the Galvez where we would host events here for the Black Panther Lake uh, Council uh, Winter Ball. And I can remember people coming from far and wide, all suited and zooted up to come down to Galveston for that winter ball, man. And that was just such a happening event, man. And you would just see so many good looking black folks, man. And I'm talking about, it, it, it just really said in my, in my mind that, you know, we are still very regal and raw people, man. And we just have to remember who we are, how we got here, and the greatness that is still within us here as we move around in this space. And even though I walk around now and I don't see a whole bunch of us down here, I see enough people still here where that story can still be told and that legacy can still be talked about. And even all of the different housing projects that have now been gentrified into other types of housing units and these type of things. We remember the stories of the people who were there before we got the housing that we have now. And we don't want to forget them and we don't want to forget that they were displaced throughout the United States. So uh, just really excited to always come back and get a little bit more of the story that I can tell and keep telling the story by because we don't want this story to be forgotten.
Well, Steven, thank you so much, man. It's so good to see you again. Appreciate you taking the time uh, to let me interview you for Humans of Galveston. What final words would you like to share? Oh, uh, the final words I would like to share uh, with you know the rest of the humans of Galveston, the humans of Texas, and the United States of America is uh, don't ever lose hope. You know we we're living in some perilous times now where. There's a lot of different wars going on. There's different things going on with the weather and different things going on here with, we don't know if there's gonna be any water in certain cities moving forward. I mean, we're dealing with a lot of environmental things and we're dealing with a lot of cultural things and we're just, but you know, the thing I always want people to remember that, you know, God is still God and he is still in charge. He's still in control and He's in our heart, and we just have to treat each other with that love and that respect and dignity that he would be expecting if he came back down here tomorrow. So let's just remember, keep love first, people. There's no differences in love. Love has no color. Love is colorblind. So let's make sure that we are found trying to love one another each and every day. Thank you.